Okay, good morning, everybody. And welcome to this, our uh, final uh, network analysis session. And today we're going to be focusing on graph visualization. And this is a really important component of uh, developing network graphs as it allows for that um, graphical appraisal of the system and presentation and communication of uh, what's happening within your system. So what we're going to look at today is going to be um, how graph visualizations work, uh, first of all, and then looking at some of the uh, algorithms and coordinate systems that are used uh, for representing network data. I'll try and explain what's going on there um, as, as it's not uh, as straightforward as one might hope. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, specifically visualizing uh, graphs with network X and then with hollow views in um, Python. Then um, I will do a bit of a quick show and tell with Gephi um, to show how that works. And then uh, we'll move on to a task which will focus on hollow views um, uh, rather than Gephi as uh, due to the install difficulties. But that I will put some uh, help up with getting Gephi installed. Um, and hopefully that will take us up to um, lunchtime and yeah we'll just see see how we get on so the main objectives for today are to understand uh, how graph al algorithms seek to represent data um, and then look at visualizing graphs with a variety of open source approaches and really being able to customize the graph visualization uh, to make it uh, to add in all the attributes that you need to be able to make the most of the visualization and make it most useful. So, within a network graph, you can add in multiple attributes about the data and show a variety of different things. And you do this by changing the attributes of the nodes the edges and the layout. So if you remember, our nodes uh, often represent either individual entities, so kind of people or organizations, um, it might be services or departments, teams within our system. Those are our nodes. And we can embed different attributes um, about that uh, particular entity within the node itself and change different attributes of the node. The edges are the links between our nodes and those we can again change to be able to show different elements of um, what's happening in that interaction between the different services or different between our entities. And then we can adapt the layout itself to be able to represent elements of the system as well. So within a network graph, um, we have our have our nodes here, which are shown as these diamonds. And then these nodes, we can change various different things about them. So the size for one can be used to represent um, particularly uh, continuous attributes, can be used for discrete attributes, but um, so uh, being able to show things like the uh, eigenvector centrality or the um, uh, the amount of activity, waiting time at that particular service. Um, and those can be embedded as the size of the node itself. So we can see the distinction between the nodes in this uh, diagram. We can use color as well. So we can classify things by um, discrete attributes. So those that are um, either integer or categorical variables and embed that as uh, difference in color. 
then we can also change the shape of our nodes and use shape as, as one way of, um, again, representing categories within the graph. And also the, um, the opacity, the, uh, the alpha, which is um, the transparency of the uh, nodes themselves. So if you want to pull out certain elements of, um, uh, of the system and show them more distinctly against other elements which might not be so important, you can use that transparency difference as well. Then with edges, um, that didn't come out well. um, with edges, we can use particularly the, uh, the thickness of an edge um, for continuous uh, attributes. Uh, it's often used to represent the weight, which is the amount of activity um, passing along a particular edge. And then we can use color as well, uh, which is useful for being able to show um, different categories, again, of uh, activity or uh, different types of link between services. So the layout is also uh, an important element. And the, the way that the nodes are structured within the network is called the network topology. And this is kind of more come from um, networking of computers together. And so these often rely, uh, relate to more structured systems um, where you're employing and impressing upon it a uh, particular structure. And so in terms of network topologies, you get um, these kind of point to point, which is direct linkage, um, buses where you have um, a linear uh, element to it and everything is linked in a, uh, in a flat uh, structure. Then rings where everything's linked around in series. If you remember your uh, science, um, and electronics in science that uh, when we have stuff in series it means that they're all uh, interdependent and connected together in a chain and then uh, kind of star formations where you have um, this is like with a central server um, and that then you have things connected to that uh, which link directly back to your central server point. Uh, then we get trees, which are uh, hierarchical trees, um, structures that work with um, kind of almost blending together the kind of uh, the star and um, bus topologies. Then a mesh where everything is completely connected. This is a complete network. But quite often, our, um, our systems that we look at are natural systems, human systems that evolve, where we're not so much impressing the structure on them, often um, don't conform to one of these kind of simple topologies. They're normally a hybrid of two or more uh, topologies, and this makes them really difficult to visualize. Um, there's often no uh, standard structure to them. Um, and so what we need is some algorithms to help us to organize and visualize such complex networks with these non-standard topologies. It's nice when you do get a standard topology, um, as it's much easier to visualize when working with a small system. But healthcare systems in particular, um, police systems, these systems that evolved over time, um, which might have had some organizing structure initially and have some kind of uh, overriding structure um, impressed 
upon them don't actually in the real world conform to any kind of uh, hierarchical structure. They're in, uh, interlinked in very complex ways. So when we're trying to represent these kind of complex networks and coming up with some kind of layout which is useful for them, there's a number of common algorithms that are used to be able to do this. One of the most useful I find um, when working with uh, large data sets with kind of when you're working with 200 plus nodes uh, in your system, 200 plus entities and trying to represent all of those, the circular layout is very useful and we'll look at some examples of that because it takes away from needing to uh, try and um, it, it, it prevents overlapping of the nodes and allows you with a kind of readable format. Um, so circular layouts are often very useful. The Kamada Kwai layout um, is a layout that use, uh, positions the nodes uh, using a path length cost function. So basically that means that it's looking to group together nodes based on the shortest path, uh, path length. Um, and so those that group together and are more highly connected with uh, shorter path lengths will be grouped together. And those um, that are more distant and are longer to get to are further away. Then we get a spring layout or a, a Fruchtemann Rheingold force directed layout. They, they come up with some lovely names for these. And th this is a physics based algorithm that relies on um, uh, expansion and gravity, so resistant forces. Um, and we'll see a little bit, uh, I'll be able to show you quite well in Gephi actually how that algorithm works and how, how it expands and contracts the layout. Then we get spectral layouts um, where, well, technically the nodes are positioned using the eigenvectors of the Lapsian uh, matrix, um, which <laughs> basically means that um, it's using the eigenvector centrality and trying to impose some kind of order um, and spread out the nodes based on their um, their connectedness within the system. Um, and I won't, we're not covering Cytoscape actually, I should have taken that out. Um, yeah, there's, uh, the, the, there were a number of other uh, different um, algorithms which were implemented in different packages, uh, but kind of the spectral spring layouts, Kamada Kauai and circular layouts are the most common and are common across um, all of uh, Network X, Holoviews, and Gephi, which are the packages that we'll be looking at. Um, yeah, <laughs> even though uh, not able to get Gephi working at the moment, um, it, it, it has a really useful library of layouts and produces by far the best visualizations, um, but they have to be manually implemented uh, due to the limited integration with Python which is a shame. It's one of those that uh, we need a startup or uh, you know, a bit of a, a GoFundMe page to push and get Gephi properly integrated with, uh, with Python. So let's uh, have a look at um, actually drawing some, some graphs and doing some graph layouts and how we define our layouts and our attributes within uh, Network X and uh, Holoviews. So, if you remember with Network X, when we um, we use this to create our first uh, network graph in in uh, in the introduction to network analysis, and what we had to do was to create a uh, we took our data. And this had our nodes, um, our node IDs, 
and then we used our node IDs to define the edges with source and target edges where the edge goes from and to and uh, any attributes attached to those. Those we use to create a graph object and we um, add our nodes and edges into the graph object. And then in order to be able to uh, represent that, we need to tell Network X to generate a layout, to be able to generate a set of coordinates for uh, to be able to visualize the network. And when we did this, we used, uh, I think in the example, we used the circular and the spring layouts maybe. Um, and for this, we passed our graph object into a layout function uh, from Network X, and that returns uh, coordinates for all of the nodes. And when we go to draw our network, we do, we ask, we call draw Network X, we pass in our graph object, and we pass in our position. Um, set of coordinates, our position object. Um, we can also call the uh, layout algorithm directly in the draw function um, if, if you'd like to. And then there's a whole series of uh, keywords that um, allow us to change the, uh, the attributes of our graph and we'll look at those in more detail in a minute. In hollow views, it works very similarly. Um, what we do is, is the call is slightly different. If we're using a, uh, we can use the network X uh, layout algorithms in order to be able to uh, create a hollow views graph. And the difference with network X and hollow views is that network X uh, produces static graphs whereas hollow views allows for interactivity. And again, we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Um, but it's useful, uh, the way that hollow views has been uh, developed is that it can take, it uses the same um, algorithms and positions, uh, uh, position generation algorithms as network X. So you can call this network X layouts directly in hollow views. So I mentioned that there's a number of different uh, keywords or keyword arguments uh, that we can use to be able to customize our, the look of our network. And these uh, here, I've just noted some of the most common keyword arguments that we can do. Um, so when we've got directed graphs, we want to add arrows to our graph and we can customize the um, whether there are arrows, the arrow style and the arrow sizes. Um, and then we can also do, uh, so for our nodes, we can do, we can add labels, we can change the size, the color, the shape and use various color maps as well. With the edges, we can customize the width because this is a useful attribute to be able to represent the weight. We want to do that, commonly want to do that. Um, we can uh, change the edge color, the uh, provide it with a color map um, and change the line style as well. We can also customize the fonts that are being used for the labels. And this is important to be able to try and get the right sizes. Um, and you can even do, because uh, you might want to be able to do the font size relative to the, uh, the size of the node itself. Um, so all of these are iteratively customizable that you can do it node by node. Not always the easiest thing to do, not in Network X, but um, 
I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Okay, let's get on and have a look at our first example and actually see an example of how, how this is working. So if you'd like to open the um, network X viz example.py file in the task folder um, of the session materials and open that up in spider. This bit of code um, goes through and it creates a simple graph, just some simple graph data. And you've got the function to create the graph within there. It defines the layout and then goes through and define the, defines the set of node and edge attributes. And do note the number of values for each attribute. We'll talk through this. And then we draw the plot. And yeah, here I mentioned that uh, to draw complex, really complex plots in Network X, we have to do it iteratively using loops. Um, and they, they require a fair amount of code actually to be able to write these, which is why I, um, I haven't shown you an example because it all comes very obtuse and it's just too much code to look at. Um, but the, it can be done, but it's easier to do in hollow views, um, which is why we'll introduce hollow views afterwards. Yeah, so when we talk about iteratively drawing nodes and edges, that means we've got to pull out all their, we've got to pull out um, a node and an edge, a node or an edge, and their uh, attributes, and then plot them one by one. And it's just a bit of a laborious way to be able to build a graph, um, but it is there if we need to. So, hopefully everybody's been able to open this file. And we've got, uh, so this is the network viz example.py file. And what we've got here is we're importing network X and pandas and numpy. And at the top here, um, I'll just zoom in a little bit on the, um, code for you. So up here at the top, we get our, uh, we develop our node and edge data. So here I've just defined a dic two dictionaries one for nodes and one for edges. And we've got an ID, unique identifier for our nodes and a label for them. And then ID and the label in this instance uh, as it's abstract are just uh, the same, they're just numbers. And then we use our node IDs as our inputs for our source and target uh, inputs for our edges and so where the edge goes from and where it goes to and these are used then to draw the edges between the nodes and we've also got a weight attribute here which says uh, how much activity how many times that edge is being used those nodes and edges are then created, uh, uh, then converted to uh, pandas data frames, and then they can be used as the input to the create graph function. And this is the same function that uh, we used in the previous two sessions on um, network analysis. So if I just run this top bit run it along with me and uh, hopefully it will all work for you. So we've read in our nodes and edges and they are in a data frame format. Then run the uh, create graph function and our nodes and edges are read in and used to create the graph itself. 
So this being Network X, um, we use the Network X layouts. And in this instance, it's a uh, circular layout here that uh, we've defined. So we create our position um, dictionary, which is a NumPy array of um, the coordinates for uh, each of our nodes. In this instance, we have five nodes. And this is where, on an x and y axis, they are positioned. So then we can go on and define some attributes for these, uh, for our nodes and for our edges. And for our nodes here, um, I've defined five values as a list to input as the size of each node. These you could take from um, any uh, actual, uh, any attribute, continuous attribute related to the nodes and scale that relative to uh, the kind of node, node size, which gives you a good visualization of the node because you don't want them to be too small or too large. And normally uh, with Network X kind of between around kind of 100, 100 to 200 is a good size of node uh, when uh, visualizing uh, the networks. Then we can also do the node color. And these are a list of uh, hex color codes. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, hex codes for colors. Um, I'm just going to um, bring up a, a HTML color picker because so hex codes are used as uh, to define colors in HTML. Um, we also get RGB and the CMYK um, codes as well, but it's the HTML uses hex codes. And as we change our color, the code changes. And we can go through and we can pick colors specifically and uh, use those within our graph object. Um, this is this is a good way to be able to manually control the colors that, and be very specific about the colors that you're using. And it gives you a much greater range um, than it does using the string inputs. Uh, to define colors, because you can just write blue or red or green. But there are only a very limited number of colors which can be input like that. I think it's about 10, um, including black and white. Uh, so you only really get about eight colors when inputting them as uh, string inputs. But here we can define uh, as many colors as we want um, using the hex codes. So yeah, these are uh, five hex codes that I've used to define the uh, node colors. And again, they're contained within uh, square brackets here as a list. Then we're going to also uh, do the, um, well, wanted to do the edge size um, and unfortunately, this doesn't work in Network X. <laughs> um, and so what we could do is um, here we're making a call to the graph objects to get the edge attribute of weight because we, add, we read in our weight earlier. And that... Um, to be able to draw the different edge weights, as I was saying earlier, we have to iteratively go through in a loop and draw each edge individually, um, which, yeah, it requires a lot of code and isn't very practical. 
but here we can use instead of um, drawing the edge weight what we're going to do is we're actually going to label our edges with the weight so here we use the get edge attributes and we pass in the graph object and we say which attribute we want which is weight which is what we passed in when creating our graph object and so this gives us our edge size and we can use this to define our edge label in a, uh, down the bottom here um, we're also going to change we can define the edge color and here this is just a, um, a numpy array it needs to be an array not a list um, just to make things more confusing um, but it's important that that's uh, as, as an array object and here I've just used the same hex code um, and just repeated them twice because we've got 10 edges in this graph connecting the five nodes. Each node is connected to two other, um, has two edges connected to it. So the length of our array here needs to be the same as the number of edges that we have. And likewise for the nodes, our list needs to be the same length as the number of nodes that we have. Um, as, as I mentioned, the another attribute we can change is the shape. And here we've got a uh, shape and it takes a string input that allows you to define the, um, the, um, uh, the shape of the uh, nodes themselves. And this is actually taken from matplotlib. Um, and you can define all of these different types of markers. Uh, and these are what are used by matplotlib for scatter plots um, for their points. And kind of normally you just get point as the default, just a circle. But you can override that and use any of these different markers as well. So uh, in this instance, I've put a capital D, which represents a diamond. And those are available. That's just in the matplotlib um, markers API. And then we can set the alpha, which is the transparency or the opacity of the um, of the graph. And both of these again can be set iteratively, but it means looping through and drawing them individually um, and doing it that way. So uh, just to show, just to demonstrate how uh, they are changed, just changing them for the whole graph here. So once we've built up this list of uh, attribute inputs, we can then go ahead and draw our graph and input these into the graph. So we use, uh, we create our plot and use um, nx.draw. And then we pass in our graph object, g here, pass in our position object, which is our um, array of um, sorry, our dictionary of coordinates, which define where the nodes are. We then pass in our list of node sizes. So in node size, passing in the end size object. In node color, we pass in our node color list. Then node shape um, is just shape, so just a single string. Alpha, the value, alpha value, and edge color, we pass in the NumPy array containing the edge colors. Then after this, we've got um, this call to draw network X edge labels. And this is drawing on the actual labels onto the edges themselves. So it needs to know 
which, what the graph is, so what the edges are, where they're located, what the position is given for the nodes so that it can determine where the labels should be placed. And then the labels themselves, which here we've got our E size um, object, which is uh, the weight attributes. So just going to run the attributes here. So end size that goes in as a list, end column as a list. E size that ends up being a dictionary. So the weights are output as a dictionary. E col is our numpy array, then our shape and alpha values. Then we can run the plot and draw that. And if I go to the plots pane here, you can see that we get our graph with our five nodes shaped as diamonds. They've got their different sizes relative to what we've input here. Um, and the colors, each is colored and the edges are colored and our um, labels have been put on as well. If we run these, if I run this again just individually, you can see the, um, the edges are initially drawn without labels. And then if we draw them, uh, if we run those lines separately, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, it's important at when doing uh, these network graphs um, that you run the code together when plotting because they um, it needs to be drawing on the same plot canvas and the way that matplotlib works um, now is that it relies on instead of saying I'm going to start a plot in the code you have to run the code together to keep it on the same canvas so when we run those two lines together plots both at the same time on the same canvas uh, using the same coordinate system. So have a little play, run, run that code, see, see if you can get that running. Can, can, can I ask, is it, is it yeah. meant to look three dimensional or as a flat surface? Uh, it's just as, sorry. Is Just, it looking three-dimensional? It, it looks <laughs> it looks sort of like a, a three-dimensional to me, but it's not meant to be, is it? It's just a flat surface. Yes, yeah, it's yes. just a just a flat two-dimensional okay, okay. plot. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think it's funny with some of these where um, you start to get perspective with the joins. Um, it can, yeah, if you look at it, it uh, it, it can look uh, like a bit of an optical illusion in a way. Uh, has anybody got any uh, questions about uh, drawing plots with Network X at the moment? When drawing simple plots um, and testing things out, uh, Network X is, is okay, um, but it's often not the go-to uh, for drawing networks but it allows it allows us to demonstrate the way that the different attributes can be used quite nicely um, in order to be able to customize the plot and um, yeah sorry um I just wanted to say looking at that what what does it tell you okay well here we can see that i mean this is just an abstract graph mm. um with made up numbers but uh if, but if, it, that, if it wasn't if it wasn't yeah. pretend it's not yes so that you will have um for example that whatever attribute is contained here in the purple node is larger than 
the one in the yellow node. So you get that relative kind of visual relative distinction going, oh, this is larger than this is. Um, and likewise... So uh, as, as an example, if this is, say, wards in an acute unit... Yes. Yeah, so if you did wards in an acute unit, can you give me an example of what that would be then? So this could be the, uh, the number of people on the ward. Okay. Um, okay. That uh, the current um, bed occupancy levels okay. within the ward. And then we might be looking at uh, that the edges are representing transfers between the wards. And yeah. our edge weights are the number of people that have transferred between particular wards. Right, right. Okay. And so we can see which wards, where people are being transferred between the particular wards. So our edges and enable us to see that people are moving between the uh, red ward and green ward. Uh, and they're moving between green ward and yellow ward. And would it be possible to make those those lines thicker to emphasize that? Yes, so this is what I was saying about the, the weights. So here we've written on, we've used labels. But you couldn't make them the thicker. Mm. But in, ne in Network X, you have to do that it iteratively using loops to draw each edge individually because it isn't uh, within the code, the, the package itself, it isn't capable of iteratively drawing okay. those uh, the edges to represent the weights. But we'll see um, an example in hollow views where we so do have that. On your example there, how many attributes can you put, have you got on there maximum? Could you put on so, there? So here we've got, um, We've got the size yes. of the nodes. Uh, we've got the um, color of yes. the nodes. Yes. We've got the um, color of the edges. We've got the weight of the edges. So four. Um, so you've got four. Four there attributes. Yes. At the moment, um, and we're not we're not using the layout. And but you could also have different. Um, shapes so nodes. five and then could you have like dashed lines as well you can you six can. so you could have six on there then yeah i wouldn't necessarily i wouldn't recommend that because what you've got to remember is it's trying to keep your graph understandable right okay when things yes. get too busy it, it gets too complex it's too much information for and people you can't to process. read it so You're really about four graphs. Okay, okay. Sean, yeah. Yes. Sean, in terms of the graph that we're looking at with the data that you put in there, is this a directed graph as well? I mean, you know, does... Yeah. Because I, I noticed that sort of like on the edge data that you've got, you've got one goes to two and three, but five goes to one. So is there some sort of direction on it as well or not? There is. So um, we haven't drawn the arrows here. In fact, let me just see if I can... I think it's just I think it's arrows equals true. But um, yes, it uh, would be directed. No, it didn't. I think um, so when you create the graph object, um, it's that you create a digraph with Network X, um, just wondering uh, if I do, yeah, let's digraph. If I just adapt the code here a second and see if I can. Yeah, so now that I've converted it to a digraph um, object, and it's saying, okay, yep, I am a digraph, I'm direct, I directed graph, direction is important here. Um, it adds in the arrows here, and we can see which, that we've got two edges coming from each node. 
and but there's also two going to each node, which is why it looks like four. Can you have like in PCA where they are nearer to each other if they're more similar and yes. further away if they're they're not? Yeah, yeah, and um, we'll look at that in um, in some of the other layouts. Uh, it all depends on the type of layout that you're doing and okay. how you're defining that closeness. So that could be by uh, the path length between yeah. the nodes, by the eigenvector centrality, which is the connectedness across the graph, whether it's facilitating connections across the graph. It could be the degree, the modularity, um, all normally things to do, it, think things that are related to the connectedness, the similarity, um, closeness of the uh, of the nodes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So that's that's how we can do in Network X um, some nice simple. Uh, drawing of a network graph and then you can just scale that up um, and just work with uh, working with your, your own data. Um, hollow views, uh, let's have a look at hollow views and see an example of how uh, drawing of a chord diagram is a useful way to be able to represent um, uh, network data. So chord diagrams are a circular layout and as uh, mentioned they're useful for when you have a large number of nodes. And so chord is a very is a special type of object in hollow views. Um, HV here is the um, the acronym uh, when we import hollow views. It's the uh, convention that's used and then we use chord and we add our edges and our nodes to it and then there's a whole load of options that we can change for our graph object um, again the color maps um, colors labels nodes um, colors uh, it uses the same keyword arguments as network x so if you open the basic hollow views example.py file and we'll have a look at that together with a couple of different looking at a couple of different data sets. So in the basic hollowviews.py file, we've got, um, we're importing network X, pandas, hollow views, and also a couple of additional um, uh, components, which are not um, brought in by default by hollow views that you have to specify. One is the ops, and ops is the um, the options command to be able to customize the graph fully, and but that needs to be brought in separately, and also dim, and we'll talk a bit more about uh, these uh, dims, these dimensions, um, as Hollywood calls them, in in a in a moment when we go through the code. So this, um, for this graph, we're going to start by using the uh, now familiar uh, Game of Thrones uh, season one data. And we're going to uh, read in, again, our nodes and edges as uh, pandas data frames. And one important thing with hollow views is that we have to specify a renderer to use. Um, 
by default, this is matplotlib. Um, the, for chord diagrams, the uh, renderer that we want to be using is called Booker. And Booker is a, um, a, a rendering engine which has, is developed specifically for web applications and works uh, to render the, um, the hollow views plots uh, as HTML files and works very well to be able to do that and works specifically for chord diagrams. So we just, we have to define this. And we also define our output size, which is the output of the uh, graph, how large we want the graph to be. And that's uh, by uh, pixels, I believe 300 by 300. So when uh, the inputs for um, hollow views chord plots are um, an edge list and a node data set, uh, hollow views uses a specific type of data set object, custom data set object for its nodes. And it contains a whole lot of information in there. And this is because it uh, is attaching attributes to, um, to the nodes in a dynamic way. And it means that we can create dynamic graphs and change elements of the graph and work with the graph data in an interactive manner. And so we have to, our edge is going as a, um, as a data, as just a standard data frame, I believe. Just check. Yeah, yeah. Um, just goes in as a data frame object. But our, um, our nodes, node data needs to go in as a uh, data set object. Sorry, I'll just zoom in again. Now, with this data set object, we've defined, um, we put passed in our nodes, our nodes data frame, but very specifically, there's this second argument here. Now, this is what's called a KDIM, and this is where our DIM call here becomes important when we import that. The way that uh, hollow views works is that within this data set, you define something called KDIMs and VDIMs. Now KDIMs are key dimensions, and these are what are called, uh, they're your independent variables. They are um, the things that you want to be able to change. Uh, the things that determine, that, uh, that organize your data, um, the organizing principles of your data. Um, so in this instance, it's the node ID, but then we might have a secondary organizer by uh, some kind of category, which might be, um, uh, it, it could be uh, age categories or um, gender, ethnicity, anything like that, or perhaps team type, um, whether uh, it's uh, the type of department, um, ED, um, orthopedics, um, inpatient, outpatient, those kind of categories that determine how our data is organized. And then we get something called VDIMs and VDIMs are the dependent variables. So these are what we're measuring. These are our measurement attributes. So there'll be um, things like the waiting time, the number of people uh, on the waiting list, the um, number of uh, people in beds in, uh, on a ward, uh, the number of 
hours that a team's working, the referral to treatment time, anything that we're measuring about our system are the dependent variables and they're referred to as VDIMs in Hollet Views. So within the data set, we, we set those. And then that means that we can use them uh, later to be able to uh, customize our plot. So in this first chord graph here, we are defining our edges, defining the node data set object. Then we've got our chord object itself. So into chord, we pass in the edge list and our node data set. And just out of a quirk of the syntax, these are held in two sets of brackets here. And then we can change the uh, a, a variety of different attributes about the graph. And in this first example, it's just we call chord, which is the name of our chord graph object, dot ops, open that, and then we need to call ops dot chord. And that means that we can change some uh, key parts about the, uh, the way that the graph will function. So here, we've got a call to inspection policy. And I put nodes. And we'll see how that works in a minute. And tools, hover. And edge, hover, line color, green. Node, hover, fill color, red. Now, that all just sounds very bizarre. But let's run the graph and have a look at what's happening here. So just run the graph and it's created the graph. But you'll go to the plot window and there's there's no plot output. With hollow views, because they are HTML files, they're interactive graph files, they have to be launched within a web browser. So we need to use the hollow view save and to save the graph as a chord diagram. And that will save to where your working directory is. And when we go through, so this is simple chord. And what we get is a 300 by 300 graph, as we define the size of that. It's a, a chord layout, which is a circular layout. And when we hover over, we get labels of the nodes. And this is where those options about the inspection policy come in. That it's hover on the nodes, and we get the node is highlighted in red and the links are highlighted in green. So this is um, an interesting way to be able to create these very um, useful interactive graphs. And this is very much the kind of most basic things that you can do with them is to be able to hover and see what's happening. You can then add um, sliders and etc uh, sliders buttons drop downs to be able to subset and customize the graph as well and uh, there is a uh, bonus video uh, which is an intro to uh, python dash uh, and dash is uh, an interactive um, is a, a dashboard builder uh, within Python that allows you to embed these kind of hollow view graphs and create a dashboard around them to be able to work and uh, customize the graph and explore the graph further. Um, and I'll make sure I uh, point to that and it's on the HSMA video playlist. But that, yeah, that uh, means learning 
dash um, and we don't quite have time to uh, teach that so we'll stick to the simple interactive graphs at the moment but um, yeah these you know we can see that actually with relatively little code we what we've built is a complex interactive graph here um, and hopefully that's worked for everybody anybody had any issues there running that um, I had a load come up, which then required me to install extra modules, and then it mine's full of warnings, but it has finally run. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, there's a lot of dependencies um, that were run with hollow views. Um, this <laughs> is funny with networks. They seem like such simple things, but um, creating and rendering them like this it actually requires a lot of computational um, uh, complexity in the background uh, to make it happen and uh, so they just require a lot of dependencies um, so hopefully it's picked up automatically and been able to run those for you okay so that's a bit of a plain um, chord diagram there you know it's it's, it's, it's all right our, our nodes um, you know, highlight and uh, our edges highlight. It makes it quite easy to see. Um, Sean, sorry, can I ask yes. a question? Um, cool. Because I really like this. I think this is really nice, actually. Uh, that it, it seems to be that the um, the ones that are most sort of densely connected are, are uh, it's kind of spaced them out. So there's large spaces in the, the sort of southwest corner. You've got Ned there. Um, is, is that deliberately? Is that part of the algorithm? The way it's kind of spaced those things out because you can see see them quite clearly those uh, sort of uh, seem to be spaced out on the on the rim uh, that seem to be more connected yeah so the way the chord diagrams spacing them is yeah exactly based on the degree um, so the number of connections that they have um, and there's we haven't done it here but what's a nice way to walk you can organize the order of the um, nodes by the degree so actually you have all of the those that are highly connected grouped together and then those that are less highly connected grouped together or group them based on different attributes and sort the order you can change the order in which the nodes are um, shown around the outside oh, okay. this is kind of the deep the default is to um, uh, kind of try and get the best spread around the outside yeah so to avoid too much overlap it's really nice i like that yeah um and just to say so um the hollow views library is is developed by uh plotly and uh plotly build uh dash and so that's why they all work together very well um, but hollow views is a much larger library that uh, you can create all types of graph in there. Um, it draws from the plotly plotting library, um, which is slightly it employs matplotlib, but is it uses Booker and other um, backends as well. Um, and so you can create uh, interactive uh, scatter graphs and line graphs, bar charts, box plots, and so that you get the same functionality of being able to hover and see different attributes about your um, about your plot and explore it in an interactive way using different widgets, uh, sliders, and buttons, and uh, drop downs. Okay, right. Well, nice simple example. Let's have a look at a, um, a more uh, customized version of this graph. So we can, here's a couple of uh, different little tweaks that we can do. We can um, set our uh, default options for our graph. So if we're creating multiple graphs, we can change the default options using the call ops.defaults 
and we can change the ops options for the nodes and the options for the graph overall and for the edges as well. And here we create a dictionary containing specific um, uh, options and um, for our keyword arguments. It's got the keyword argument and the value. And these can be passed in to the uh, default options. Um, so this is just setting the height and width and turning off any axes. But then, yeah, so um, what we're going to do now is um, create a, another uh, chord graph. And this time, we're going to um, color it using a color map called Category 20. And basically, this is 20 different colors which are used within the color map uh, for the nodes and for the edges as well. We're going to define the node size. Um, the edge line width, uh, the node color, and the edge color. And here we're controlling the node color setting using our key dimension, our KDIN, that we set earlier, our ID. And here, so that means that we're setting um, ID as our uh, KDIN. And then we're going to, uh, in our edges, we're using our source as our um, the setting uh, of where uh, the, to take the color from. So the source node will determine the color of the edge. And they use need to be uh, cast as string um, objects into the uh, node color and edge color attributes. So I'm hoping this is going to work. So Right, so here we get colored chord and we get again our, um, uh, our node, um, our, uh, sorry, our um, uh, chord diagram and it's uh, all of the colors uh, are, have been assigned and because we've got more nodes than we do colors, they repeat around. And our uh, the source node determines the, um, the color of the edges as well. Now, what you'll notice here, as Dan picked up on last time, that this is, um, they're not spaced out by the degree. And this is because in the code, we've not called chord, we've created just a graph object. And this means that um, it's using a, a circular layout, but it's not employing all of the chord um, properties and, and not thinking about it as a chord diagram per se. It's, it's just a circular graph. Um, and just showing that you can uh, create these kind of circular graphs just using the graph function as opposed to using the uh, chord function. Uh, and with the graph function, you can then tweak some um, additional properties and set things up 
to more of a uh, custom layout. Just to um, give you a little bit of a play as well within here. So this window is fully interactive. Um, you get these little buttons on the right hand side. And so you can uh, use box zoom, wheel zoom, and tap as well. Uh, I prefer the wheel zoom, um, but you can just zoom in and out on your graph. You can pan, do a box zoom, and then you've got a reset button down here to reset your axes. And you can also save these plot outputs. So it will save the window and download it as a ping file. So they're kind of they're quite nice and fully um, easily interactive uh, within their containers. OK. I'm just going to quickly show you as well. We've got. Um, so there is a Facebook data set that uh, is used in one of the hollow views examples. And this uses a um, predefined coordinate system, uh, which is very interesting. Um, so I'm just going to show you, read in this uh, data. So our edges start end. Yep, hang on. No, hang on. I'm going to have to go. If I just pull up the raw data for the Facebook nodes. So this data set um, uses a predefined coordinate system um, and basically sets up the some of the visual elements of uh, the graph bef within the data that's read in. So what it gives you is an ID for the node, because normally we just reading we we say here's our I node id here's some attributes attached to it and a label um give me a coordinate system here they've actually defined where all the nodes go using x and y giving x and y coordinates for every node um this is this is difficult uh, to do um unless you find a particularly good algorithm and manage to get a good layout of your nodes, you can output the coordinates and reuse those coordinates as an input for the graph visualization um, at a later date and maintain that consistency of the look of the graph. So um, yeah, uh, the gra graph coordinates are one of these that uh, if you can find a way to uh, be able to determine, predetermine the layout. It's, it's quite a nice thing to do. Um, and because it ends up giving you some quite nice graphs. So we get, we run that and we go to the FB graph. And so this is the graph that that draws. And this gives you, again, get the interactivity. Now, one thing is that it, can, it, it does look a bit messy, this, um, this graph, and it gets a bit um, difficult to see what's, what's happening in here. Um, so there is something called, I'll show you. Um, so it's called the data shader within hollow views and basically it enables you to be able to bundle up the edges in a graph and produces a much nicer visualization 
So if I run that, it takes a little while to run um, as it's just going through and working out how, how am I best going to fit all of this together. But this is a nice algorithm that works um, across different uh, types of graphs as well. It works extremely well on these complex network graphs. And now we've got a, it's basically pinched all of the edges together and um, gives you a nicer look, a much more easy to explore looking graph. So kind of the, uh, the message from this is that there are lots of different ways to draw network graphs, even just within uh, hollow views, which is um, kind of had some very specific things built into it for drawing network graphs, but there's multiple different ways to do it and a lot of different keyword arguments that you can change and different ways that you can use the graph um, and be able to interact with the graph. Kind of adding that interactivity just adds additional layers of, of uh, complexity there. But hopefully that's um, all running for you and so you can see some how these examples are working. Um, actually, Sean, when we try to run the last bit of code, it comes up with an error about no module named X-Array. So do you know what library that might be in? Uh, Heather, just to say, so it should be, so I've just uh, encountered the same problem. And if you install X-Array and then Condor install Data Shader, it should work. But I, I think Jenna, I think, had a problem where it's still not working. Um, but I can uh, it right. works on Linux. Um, okay, so so is that a Conda install for both of those? Yeah, so do um, Conda install X-Array and then Conda install Data Shader, um, and it seems to work now on mine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I've forgotten that they had to be installed separately. I thought they were installed as part of Hollow Views. It's, <laughs> it's been a while, a couple of years since I've installed these now. <laughs> okay. So um, what we're going to do is look at uh, one more example and then we'll uh, take a, a little break. Um, what I just want to show you is looking at the advanced hollow views example is how we bring together um, network X and our graph metrics, creating graph um, metrics. So things like the measurement of degree, eigenvector centrality, page rank, um, looking at modularity, things like that, which Network X is designed for and really good at doing. And then being able to use that as an input into uh, Hollowviews visualization so that we can visualize those graph metrics and not just our operational measures. So this code, um, again, we start by importing our um, network X pandas and hollow views and reading in, we'll just do it with the uh, Game of Thrones data again. And we read in uh, using our uh, create graph function for network X. We have to go through and create the network X graph, undertake the analyses and then extract the analysis output and convert it so that it's in a suitable scale 
um, and format so that it can be read in and used by hollow views. So here, so if we run this, creates the network X graph, and then I can get the eigenvector centrality and the page rank. Um, so here we get dictionaries output from network X with our uh, node IDs and the value being the uh, page rank, the eigenvector centrality. Um, so to convert those for use in hollow views, I've um, gone through and done it where, so converting from a dictionary into a data frame and then so that we can transform and work on the values nice and easily and they're in a, a nice format um, that we then uh, can change the size of the um, uh, sorry the to scale up the uh, eigenvector centrality and page rank values because if we look eigenvector centrality here kind of ranges between um, well in fact the easiest way to do it is if I show you e we look at e cent and we go um, oh no it won't that won't work because it's not a data frame yet um, so e sent um, size and working on the column sense value using so the minimum value that we get from ESENT is 0 0.0005 that's a really small value <laughs> um, and if we do max uh, it's 0 0.3 so you've got a real range of values but they're all really quite small and if we wanted to use this, for example, for the size of the node, then actually what we need is a larger value, kind of around, uh, you know, in the tens, at least. Let's have a go. We can experiment with that. So, you know, and have a little bit of a play. So I've scaled up the uh, eigenvector centrality, multiplying it by 100 and multiplying the page rank size by a thousand to give values to uh, inputs into as uh, the node sizes. Okay, and then the easiest way that I found to do this was to join the um, these attributes then the sense size and the page rank size. Um, for each node and join that to the node's data frame. So now we get nodes extended and this gives us our ID, our label and our attributes as a nice data frame, which we can then convert into the whole of these data set. So here again, define our renderer using Booker and then we've got the edge list and as, as before, but this time within the Holoviews data set, passed in our data frame of nodes extended. So it's got all, it's got our attributes in there. We use an ID as our independent variable, our, um, uh, our KDIM, our key dimension. And then passing in the uh, centrality value and the rank values in a list, so between square brackets, as the uh, VDIMs, the dependent variables. 
and so the value dimensions so that we can use those within our graph. So here we're setting our um, options and creating our graph as before, but this time I'm using node size and passing the centrality value, the cent underscore value dimension in as our node size. So basically it'll pick up those values and use them to determine the node size. Okay, so when we run this, Go through and again, we get our get our output HTML file. And this time we've got the node sizes determined by the uh, centrality value in this instance. And you'll also note that within the label now, it's got the centrality and the rank value there. So this is kind of very much just starting out on the road to really heavily being able to heavily customize this type of graph. And what you'll notice as well is that it's adapting the graph to try and avoid overlapping the nodes. Yeah, the um, the kind of the the crazy computationally expensive thing here is how is the adaptive rendering of these uh, graphs, which is why they work best as uh, embedded as web objects, um, because they can be uh, yeah, quite, quite large. Okay, so that's been an example of, um, first of all, how we create simple visualizations in Network X and being able to manually set our, create and set our attributes. Going through into hollow views, so interactive graphing here, being able to do, uh, produce just a simple graph uh, with simple interactivity and then being able to start building up and customizing more of the attributes. Um, an example with the Facebook data of being able to create um, a more uh, controlled type of uh, graph um, and using the bundle, being able to bundle up and change some of the um, line attributes there. Um, and then in the advanced example, um, being able to use Network X to produce uh, information that we can then embed within our graph and, and use that to uh, determine our visual parameters of our graph and convey that data. So Just saying, so uh, Network X, uh, yeah, great for analyzing our networks um, and Holopy is pretty good at visualizing them, but it does mean we have to create two separate graph objects and it's a bit of a, a process that you have to go through. So we take a bit of a break now um, and for 15 minutes and then come back and I'll do a little run through of Gephi and then get you to have a play and uh, create 
your own graph in hollow views using a new data set um, and just let you run wild a bit with um, having a play with uh, some of the uh, and finding some of the different attributes that are available uh, and using the documentation to identify and adapt to those. So um, if we have a break until uh, 20 past 11, come back then. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can um, have a little think over the break. And if you've got any questions, we can st we'll start with uh, any questions and then go into having a look at Gephi. Sean, sorry, just to flag up, there's a, there's a bit of um, chat on the chat. Um, so uh, it seems that whilst I've managed to get um, Data Shader and X-Ray installed and it all works fine, and a couple of others have who, who are using Windows and it all works fine, uh, a lot of people are having the same problem that it's throwing up a very weird error. Um, so I don't know if that's something you can look at after the break. Uh, it's, uh, okay, I'll have a little look and uh, see what's happening there. Brilliant, thank you. No problem. So, visualizing graphs with Gephi. Um, Gephi, uh, yeah, well, it was being maintained up until 2017 um, and is weirdly still um, the best kind of standalone piece of software that I've found uh, for network visualization and analysis. Um, it does produce great looking graphs and um, it's got some of the analysis functionality built in. So you can um, include graph metrics within the graphs themselves and use that to uh, help with the visualization. Um, it's to use it really effectively. Um, you can undertake an analysis in Network X and then output your analysis uh, with the node and the edge metrics it attached to your node and edge lists um, in attach them in a data frame and then export them as a CSV and import that into Gephi. So then you've got all of your analysis attributes there um, attached to the edges and the nodes and you can then use that So um, in the slides, uh, I've um, included kind of the little overviews of the screens and what each one does. Um, but I will go through and show you this uh, in Gephi itself. So I... Ooh. So Gephi, when it starts up, gives you, um, first of all, kind of this welcome window and you can select new project and start creating a new graph. Um, the opening page, it, this is kind of your main um, editing window for the uh, graphs themselves. And up the top here, we have uh, three different buttons. We have overview, which is the uh, view that we're in now. Then we get the data laboratory, which is where we, is a very nice name for uh, where we import our data. And then a preview window as well, which is where we preview the, uh, and the output of the uh, graph itself. And we can also uh, change some of the um, visual attributes uh, to make it all look very nice. So the data laboratory is where we need to start in order to be able to bring in our data. And so you can create data 
um, within here and just manually add nodes um, and edges. And there are, we got our nodes and edges here. So let's change it nodes. And it requires that there be an ID and a label with our data. And then with the edges, we need a source and a target and a type of edge as well, either directed or undirected. And then a unique ID as well. Those are the required fields. So what we're going to do is we're going to import, oh, I'm going to import a spreadsheet. And so for this, I'm going to bring in the uh, Game of Thrones ones. And so I need to import the nodes, first of all. So the import window gives us uh, this, these input options where the file is coming from. It's a comma separated file. And I want to import it as the nodes table. Um, and then click next. Uh, time rep we haven't got any time representation in here, so that's fine. We bring in an ID and label. Finish. And so this is a going to be a uh, directed graph. And I want to make make sure that I append it to the existing workspace. And so we can see this is brought in the ID and the label for the nodes. Now I need to bring in the edge data as well. So again, I go import spreadsheet and I can bring in the edge file. And here I've got source, target, weight, and the season. Um, and bringing this in, importing it as the edges table. And here we get source, target, and it's just double checking the um, values that we want to bring in weight and uh, season as so as a double and an integer, integer values. Um, again, it's a directed graph and we want to append it to the existing workspace. And so here we read in our source, our target, the type, and attributes a unique ID to each edge. And we've also got here the weight column and the season as well. And so this, this is our, we've got our node and edge data all read in, and we've got a basic rendering of our network here. It's all a bit messy. But we can see that Kefi has already um, done the arrows, done our edges with arrows as arrows because it's a directed graph, and done the line thickness by the weight. Over here on the uh, right hand side, we've got some various different graph metrics that we can calculate. For the, uh, for the graph itself, for the network overview, for a node overview, and for edge overview. And we can use these different metrics in order to be able to um, visualize uh, those within the graph. Now, I'm just going to run the modularity one. So we get the uh, different modularity attributed within the graph. So this is um, a useful metric for looking at how um, the nodes group together. And we can then use this to help determine our appearance of our nodes and our edges. So for our nodes, we're going to we can partition our nodes based on modularity class. And what this means is that we've got um, uh, six different classes here. Um, 
each containing a certain percentage of the nodes. And this is how um, the analysis is broken down, the groupings of the different nodes. And I can now, if I hit apply here, it colors my nodes and my edges by the modularity class. You can also do this using uh, ranking, uh, where we can use a color gradient, um, which gives us single, well, in this instance, single color, but we can also adjust the, um, these color values as well. But I think the, the partition makes a little bit more sense in this instance. Our edges, I'm going to um, do that based on the weight. And we'll do that um, actually. Do it based on the weight and the ranking. And so just to differentiate a little bit there. And we can also add to our nodes. Um, we can also do the label colors and the size of the nodes. So let's uh, do the node ranking based on the uh, degree. And when we apply that, some of the nodes are a bit small. So let's use um, 10 to 30 as our differentiation. So we can see some of our nodes have a greater degree than others. And we just start to be able to visually discriminate that. OK, so we've got our different node sizes. We've got our edge weights embedded within there. Um, the color of our edges based on the degree and the um, color of the nodes based on the modularity, so the groupings of our nodes. Now, it's all just uh, in a random layout, just a bit messy. So there's down here, we've got the layout box. And now we can go in and use one of these the variety and actually a combination of these different layout options to be able to uh, try and come up with a uh, decent uh, layout for our nodes. So let's let's have a go and uh, try and uh, work out which if we can get a decent layout. So. Um, Force Atlas is a, uh, a physics-based algorithm that uh, uses, um, well, it uses here a uh, tolerance of speed, repulsion, gravity, um, and various different uh, tweaks to the algorithm that you can do to be able to tune it. And basically these run and they run time and time again, trying to find a decent layout. So if I run that, oh dear, it's grouped everything together quite heavily. That's not particularly useful. But what we can see actually, that is that it started grouping the nodes together by their different colors, by their modularity. So that is quite useful. The expansion allows us just to blow the graph up and spread it out. And that starts to give us a bit of a better representation of our graph, a bit more useful here. And when we hover here, it shows which nodes another node is connected to. When we hover on one, it highlights all of the nodes that that node is connected to just uh, as a kind of helpful visual exploration, to, uh, to aid in visual exploration. Let's also have a go with the Novalap. So this is um, to try and prevent overlap of uh, nodes and edges as far as possible. 
So it just kind of shifted them about a bit. Try the label adjust, see if that does anything. No. Um, try the Fructimum Rheingold. Ooh, that's given us a interesting spectral layout here in more of a circle. Um, go with just a random layout. Whoa, that's uh, just brought it all back down. Let's expand that. So that is just as we had at the beginning, more of a random setup. Try the Force Atlas here, and you can see that's shifting about. Expand that again. So I'm going to just work with this and uh, show you now um, what happens when we go to the preview. So in the preview, uh, there's nothing there at the moment, but if I hit refresh, it generates a uh, an output representation of our uh, network graph using the layout, but also these uh, parameters here on the left hand side. Now, here we can set all different um, kind of visual um, parameters for the nodes and node labels, edges, edge arrows, and the edge labels. And this means that uh, at the moment, we got it all looks a bit messy. So our edges need to be rescaled. So um, if I click the rescale weight here and refresh, it takes them right down. And so the rescaled weights are between 0.1 and 1. I'm going to make them a little bit bigger, make them between 10, 1 and 10. Let's see if that is any better. Yeah, so we can see that we're starting to get the thicker edges shown here as well. So we see a differentiation in the graph. Now, um, node labels are always really, really handy. So let's show our labels. And if I zoom in here, we can start to see which um, nodes are being grouped together and how they group together. Um, in this instance, within this data set is kind of the characters that are talking and appearing together within the TV show. And that the modularity has linked to those who were most commonly uh, linked together. And so this is, you know, kind of a, a quick and dirty kind of visualization, but we can already see that this is a, uh, a nicer visualization of a large graph than we might get with uh, Network X for certain. Um, and this is kind of why we use the chord layout, because the algorithms are not quite so good for um, uh, uh, for, for hollow views as they are for um, uh, Gephi. But that's something that uh, uh, the, the researchers need to be and software developers need to be working on. I'm just going to change this a little bit and go back to my preview. And if I hit refresh, it changes and updates based on the um, new layout that I've selected. So we can we start to see that there's a nice representation of a graph. And then we can export these graphs as um, either uh, SVGs, uh, scalable vector graphics, PDF, 
or a uh, ping or portable network graphic. Um, these are all very useful file types for outputting images. Scalable vector graphics allow you to go in and edit all of the lines within um, something like Adobe or uh, Inkscape, Inkscape being the open source option. Um, and ping files have, a trans uh, have the option to have a transparent background. So it means that you can, um, you don't have large white borders and you can have overlaps um, and work with it much easier when including these images within uh, presentations. So that is a very quick overview of Gephi. Um, it's a shame that uh, has yeah, it, it didn't sound like anybody had managed to get it working um, as it would so have been quite John, quite I, nice. I have. I downloaded it on my Mac and it works fine on there. Ah, right. OK. Um, do we do we have anybody else who's managed to to get it working at all? No. OK, right. Um, OK, Greg, <laughs> you can you can have a play. Um, if, if you fancy that uh, as part, part of the task now. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is, um, if I bring up the, uh, so to have a, Kind of now, you know, just for um, the next uh, kind of 20 minutes or so, um, is to have a go at using the, um, there's uh, within the data uh, in the task file, I've included the Game of Thrones season eight data set. And to, if, if uh, you haven't got Gephi, to have a go at adapting the um, hollow views code to show the um, Game of Thrones season eight data. And if I point you to, I'm going to put in the chat, the user guide for hollow views. Um, and all the documentation where the API is. Um, so that you can go in and search the uh, graph functions and to have a little look at a uh, little play about with it and see um, kind of what it's like to work with. So that's the link to the user guide. And the other one that will be useful is the um, the API. And basically take that data, use the example code that um, we've already got, um, and try and adapt it to use uh, to uh, visualize that season eight data set and see uh, how you get on. And it's, it's just having a little play really, nothing, it, no serious output. And, um, this uh, it's actually quite difficult, the uh, this kind of network visualization. And so it's something that if you decide to do a project with it, you need to think about your data and um, kind of explore it and explore using different types of visualization and see what works best. It's quite an iterative process. Uh, there's kind of no real hard and fast rules, which makes teaching this quite difficult. <laughs> um, so it's kind of seeing possibilities and having, uh, having a bit of a go at it. Um, so yeah, I uh, just in, encourage you to have a play 
uh, with bringing in that new data set and seeing if you can change uh, some of the, the attributes within it. And yeah, if we come back at, well, let's come back at uh, quarter past and just have a little, uh, a little roundup. Um, I will pop you into breakout rooms. You can work together, you can just chat um, about uh, the different things you're trying, or you can share a screen and work on it that way as well. So it gives everybody the option there. Um, and yeah, if you've got Gephi working, then uh, by all means, have a play with that same data set in uh, Gephi as well, um, as it's quite nice uh, to, to be able to do that. So I'm going to split you into uh, breakout rooms and got, uh, so 14 people. So just uh, four to five people in a room and um, just have a, have a bit of a play. Um, so it's 